morning. I will be talking about slightly different topic, and that is artificial intelligence. Uh, we know it as AI for sure. It's become a buzzword now, and uh, in many ways, it is very important as a technology. But as we go through the talk today, I'm going to try to dump down the technology portion and talk more about two aspects of this. One, where is this technology going to be applied? So as use cases, number one. Number two, as we go through new and new applications of AI into our lives, some of these you are already using as of today. As we go through these new applications, do they actually help us understand how our own intelligence works? So what exactly is human intelligence? More importantly, what is intelligence? Does it exist in other animals? Is there a way to actually abstract that intelligence into a program and probably code it? And maybe even program it. But I also try to cut out the hype and show you just how AI works. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you will kind of be able to use it. Okay. Uh, let me just start with the simplest explanation of AI. And that's all the message that you need to remember by the end of this talk. AI is nothing magical. It is actually a different way of programming. And it's a way of writing programs so that the program can learn on its own. That's the main difference. Instead of just programming manually, it's a way of programming so that the program can learn on its own. It can write more programs, hopefully good programs, and then the program can evolve. And that's essentially the message of this talk. But I'll show you very different kind of problems that you can solve. And so the applications and how you solve these problems is the message that you need to remember. So here I'm showing three very different types of systems. So there's a system like a cell, which evolves on its own. It's a biological system. That's how we all exist in, our, in terms of our bodies, plants, animals, everything runs using cells. But it's actually a system that evolves. It learns its environment, and every generation it keeps changing. And that is how life has evolved over time. It's a very complex system. Uh, similarly, if you look at our cities, we've built our cities using networks. There are multiple layers of networks. So one possible network is what is called a traffic network. It represents a very different kind of information which is moving around the city. Not just physical objects, but also how the city functions is coded in our traffic networks in that city. And then language. I'll come to language because that's another very hidden theme that you'll see through all the problems that I'll talk about today. Uh, but I also, let me just start off with things which AI isn't, and that's something you will hear a lot about. Uh, so we'll try to remove these things from our talk today. So AI is not a new artificial brain. You will probably see some things about this by the end of your lifetime, maybe in the next 50 years. But as of today, it's not really an artificial brain. It's not magic. It is a lot of math. It really is a lot of math. But again, somewhere at the end of the talk, I'll show you some things which are very, very intuitive. So what we are doing is with AI, we are actually using math to code a lot of our intuition and emotion, as well as the logic of languages and other things. And we are essentially just writing programs, okay? It is scary. It can take over the world. It's just as scary as the steam engine was to 
to mill workers in the industrial revolution about 150 years ago because all their jobs were vanishing. It is just as scary when people put the steam engine on top of wheels, steel wheels, put them on rails and made a steam engine. People were very afraid of sitting in trains and there was a very scientific, serious scientific debate. Can the human body tolerate speeds greater than 40 kilometers per hour? Scientists very, very seriously thought that since horses move a maximum of 40 kilometers per hour, anything faster than that, the human body would just crush. But as we know, we, I think we crossed that limit a while ago. Nothing much happened to us. So they, just like the Industrial Revolution changed the way we think the world around us should be, AI will change the way the world exists around us. It will change the way we think that we should think. The very process of our thoughts will change. But it's essentially just equipment and tools. And you will see this by the end of this talk. So don't be scared. All right. So I'll start with the simplest example, which is traffic networks. If you wish to go from one end of a city to another, you don't count distance. The same distance in Delhi would be very different in another city. So what do you count? You count time. And the reason you count time is because distances, roads, traffic, cars, buses, these are all shared resources which you are using at a certain time. In the time that you use that, you have to queue up and wait. You have to actually go to the airport at least two to three hours beforehand for a two hour flight. Now that doesn't make sense as such, but the reason it makes sense is those two hours that it takes to go to the airport, you are queuing up to get into the car, to get into the bus or the metro, and then you actually use the road, and then you get off, and then you go into the passenger check, checking security queue, and then you again wait, because you're going to queuing up and lining up and sharing resources to get onto the plane or the train. So it's a shared resource, and there is a very mathematical theory why you are doing this, and it's called queuing. And people had to invent queuing and complexity theory and other things to actually make cities work. All right? That's the traditional way of doing things. But what does this have to do with AI? AI can actually help you learn or use these theories without having to do these theories. And that's what we do. Our brains know it will take us two hours to get to the airport onto the plane without having to worry too much. If I go an hour beforehand, I'm going to be worrying all throughout. And the reason that is there is because our mind has already learned the costs of each leg of the journey. Okay, I'll come back to this point again. So some things are very complex, we don't know how to understand them. Other things are actually extremely complex, like for example biology. The cell is too complex to model or even fit in equations. But actually speaking, the cell runs on an engine. And the amount of information that is there in the genetic code of the cell, it's the exactly the same information which is projected across the whole body. There are 10 power 14 cells in a single human. Every single cell has exactly the same information. But the liver cell and the brain cell and the blood cell and the macrophages, everyone knows their job because there is a way of expressing genes and suppressing genes. And that's coded in the information. And it runs on its own. And the whole thing runs on a very tiny little bit of thing called the genetic code. There is actually another branch of science called epigenetics. Uh, which is separate from the genetic code, but things get complex from very simple amounts of information. So the point is, if I wish to read the language of DNA, the language is very simple to read, I can read it serially. But the amount of information that gets created from that language is too complex, and that's how the whole life is coded. The same thing now, I'm going to bring back the theme of language. If I actually take a satellite picture 
And if I try to analyze, I would actually be able to just code things in terms of features and elements. So I can actually mark trees, I can mark roads, I can build a whole city from the map. And when I extract that map, the map has a certain language. Trees don't stay very close to each other. Trees are in a certain row along the road, obviously. And what are these? These are features of the language of the map. So if I can actually learn that language, I can take a map, analyze it automatically by programs, and then understand how that city works. All right? Let's go to another thing. So we did that. We actually did a real work here where we, what you're seeing on the left is Delhi in the daytime. It's a very tiny picture, but on the right you see Delhi at night. And if some of you are familiar with Delhi, you'll actually even be able to see where, which part of Delhi we are right now in. We are probably somewhere in the southeast side. Uh, the eastern side of Delhi is UP. The western side is actually another state. And you can see the size of each and every dot that you see here is the amount of electricity being used in that village or town. And what it's telling you is you can actually build a prosperity index. And you can relate this with the census of India. And we've done this and we've created a census of India prosperity map for the whole of India. So just by taking a satellite picture, you don't need to be an alien civilization. Just humans can do this. And for every single place, you can actually analyze and find out what those humans are doing. Are they doing okay? Are they richer than other humans? You can do that directly using AI. You can actually fit this with the GDP of every single state, every single city, every single village. And you can actually generate useful data. What did we do? We picked out the features in that language and we analyzed it. In fact, we used the same AI program which was analyzing these images for satellite. We used it for a very different problem. Why? Because the language that they are talking about, this is the same in these two applications. So this is fashion. If you actually take a photograph, you can segment the image into the kind of garments which are there. Every year, the industry wants us, the clothing industry wants us to change fashion. Why? Because that actually brings out, you know, the industry wants you to change, that's all. And there's trends. And with age, as well as which region you are, you want to always be trendy. But there's a language to it. There's actually a grammar that you can parse which says, that this shirt goes well with this trousers, goes well with this blouse, or goes well with this shawl, and color, and texture, and season, okay? So you can actually learn that language, and you can create association rules, and you can parse them, and you can actually say, this shirt will not go well with this trousers, all right? And the language that is there, an AI algorithm can learn, and that language that it's predicting is very similar to the language of a city, the map of a city. And that's why the same program works. But now let's come to a slightly different problem. Uh, as of a couple of months ago, this paper was published by a research group where they took a bunch of exam papers and they trained the AI to learn and answer questions. And at the level of 8th grade exam, given the knowledge set, it can actually answer questions in natural language, English, and the answer sheets will be completely, you know, identical to other students' level, in terms of level. Does this mean that the AI has passed the 8th grade exam? That's the way of hyping it, but it's true. The AI is actually looking for patterns and objects in the language question. And then it creates a knowledge graph, a mind map, exactly the way students write, are forced by teachers to make mind maps. And it knows the relations between the objects and the features. And then it creates 
and eight to grade exam, and it can answer it. Uh, if you can do that for cheating on your eighth grade exam, let's do it for something more useful. Uh, this is the Rosetta Stone, which was discovered in 1798. It took almost 50 years for humans to decipher it. And that was when three different languages were available for translation. The same text was available for translation. You can actually try to do this for real problems. Uh, this is a language which was there in, the, in Greece called Linear B, which people have decoded by now. Uh, and if you actually put it in an AI program, the AI program can actually learn this language and predict is the translation that we have real or not. That language was from the Mycenaean civilization. This one is a language which is still not decoded. Uh, this is linear A. But the symbols that it uses, amazingly, are very similar to the Indus Valley Civilization. And uh, this is a kind of a hobby of mine. And we are trying to decode this and find relations between these languages. And someday, it, you will be able to read dead languages. The AI program that you're using is the same as which codes uh, for fashion. Uh, just to do something similar, this is Flappy Bird. We are going to play video games. We are going to actually have uh, AI try to learn how to play video games. It actually also has a language. It has a certain set of parameters and the neurons that we will use here, they are programs. They are just pieces of programs. They will learn these features and then try to play the game, okay? Uh, this is the real math, but this is high school level math. Any 10th grader can actually learn this and code this within a day. So here, I'm going to start the program. It's going to evolve. It starts with a lot of solutions, and then it tries to find the best fit. Within a few generations, it actually will find the right solution, and after that, the program will run, learn on its own. Okay, so it's actually already found the solution within four or five iterations, and it's not going to make any error. This is why video games make you zone out, because you learn the program so fast, and then after that, your pleasure centers of your brain actually just keep giving you rewards. And that's why video games are so fun. I was never allowed to play video games, so this is what I do now. But if you get to play video games, then you don't need to do this. All right? Uh, let's go to another example. A very different AI. A single program, a photograph converted into a video. So like your Harry Potter, kind of. If you remember the movies, they have these talking heads and paintings. So you can do this with real photographs. Uh, you can do it with paintings. You can change the expressions. You can even change the personality of the, the, the painting. And you'll see this here. The three people that you see there, they're actually very different. I can actually take a photograph of any of you and make it talk. I can do the same thing with voice, uh, but today we'll just stop here. So just to give you an idea of what AI can do, as of today, it can code, you could write maybe about 100,000 neurons in a real system. Within your lifetime, you'll probably reach a million, 10 million. So a certain set of skills can, will definitely surpass, go beyond human capabilities. Maybe even reasoning, maybe even emotion, probably not wisdom, but certain skills, you will be able to get super skills. And then you could use those AI to you know, aid what you are doing normally. But you probably won't reach human brain capabilities because the human brain, as of today, the known uh, amount of neurons is about 100 billion, although we don't know what they do. So there's only so much we know about the human brain. Uh, yeah, thank you very much.